Different faith and vision I've given uh, to this as a title. There's a lot of lot of Abraham in this one. Um, now I'm not talking about saving faith here. I'm talking about developing a faith to believe God for great things. We're going to look at some passages where God helps his followers develop this kind of vibrant faith, believing God to do amazing things in their lives. And some wonderful principles here we see about this. I'm going to start by how God uses the eye gate for Abraham to help develop his faith. Let's read this passage here. Genesis 13, 14. It said, The Lord says to Abraham, after Lot had parted from him, look, notice that, look, look, look around from where you are to the north and south and east and west. All the land you see I will give to you and your offspring forever. So you got the picture. Abraham perhaps in an elevated place on a hill. God tells him, stare in every direction as far as the eye can see. He fills his eyes with that image and said, this land, in time, this will be your descendants. All of this land. We Look at um, Genesis 13, 16. It says, I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. You think of the sandy soil of the Middle East. Again, he's filling his mind with an image. This sort of sand, you think of that. How many, this is just a small container of sand. And uh, you think even here, how many grains of sandy soil there is here. Just here alone, tens of thousands of them. And the Lord says to Abraham, I want you to, to look at all that sand, all that sandy soil, like every one of those grains of sand is, is going to be one of your descendants. That's, that's how many there's going to be. And the Lord fills his mind with that image of all of those grains of sand. Genesis 15, 4. The Lord said to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Let's have a look at an image of some stars here for a moment. That sort of thing. Incredible number of stars. Now, just think for a moment. We here in Melbourne, of course, we have a, a big city with an awful lot of light and a bit of smog as well. And you look up and you don't see that many stars quite often in comparison, but you imagine Abraham's situation. I can even remember a time where I'd gone fishing, um, I think it was Dartmouth uh, Dam, I think was where, anyway, northern Victoria, it's kind of fairly mountainous, and gone, stayed there a couple of times during spring, and uh, some years back when my kids were younger, and we'd stayed there as a family, but at night, I remember the kids commenting about all the stars because the amount we could see there, it was clear, it was springtime, so it wasn't, you didn't have the humid kind of thing going on, and it was just, there's no light. The town only had 40 people living there, so there's no light coming from the little town, really, and the amount of stars, unbelievable. And you think about the Middle East, Abraham's time, no pollution, sometimes it's dry heat in the Middle East. Imagine how many stars he would have seen. God said to him, count them, count them, count them. Here's Abraham looking up, 1,700,031, 1,700,032, 1,700,033. Oh, no, I've done that one. <laughs> and there he goes on and on, and you can see all the time his mind is being filled with that image, which really, which is millions. God used his eye gate to help his faith. And then in 15... Second part of five and into six. Then God said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Let me ask you the question, has God got any vision for you this year? Last series, we looked at the major prophets and how God spoke to them in different ways and called them to different things. But they had to have an ear to hear. They had to have a heart to respond. Is God saying anything to you? Might be new to university, but what's his word to you at this time? What's his word to you for this year and the near future? 
Could be a career change for some of you. Could be a promotion in your current workplace. Could be that new marriage partner. You're praying for a marriage partner. What's God saying about your retirement years? What's the Lord saying to you about ministry? You think of um, chapter 6 of Matthew where Jesus says to the people, but seek first the kingdom of God. How would the Lord have you seek first his kingdom? My point is this. Number one, seeing God's vision will release vibrant faith. Seeing God's vision will release vibrant faith. Would you say it with me? Seeing God's vision will release vibrant faith. Put some on the time. Seeing God's vision will release vibrant faith. Amen. It's not enough to see. It needs to touch our heart. We need to feel it. We need to feel it. You know, God works with our hearts, stirs up excitement, passion. He operates with the desire of the heart. Have a look at this psalm here, Psalm 37 verse 4. It says, take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Notice that. Now, God wants us to delight in him. Because as we delight in the Lord, as we're intimate with him, as we're close to him, it shapes the desires of our heart so they become godly desires. But he wants to operate with the desires of our heart. Look at this beautiful prayer, Psalm 20 verse 4. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. You know, we're encouraged to pray things over each other like that. There's a a couple... I was talking to yesterday and they said, can you pray for us after the service? And I thought of that verse when I was thinking of them and thought I might pray that over them. That's Josie and Patrick, actually, but you know, won't, won't name them out publicly, of course. <laughs> you know, they're Irish and Italian. They're off to Europe soon, actually. Sounds pretty cool. You have an awesome holiday, guys. <laughs> I'll just mention this, actually. Patrick's got a fantastic... He's been telling me his story. Um, so he's, he's your class, classic hippie sort of fella back in the 60s, you know, and whenever it was, and, you know, trying to search for spirituality by, you know, using uh, drugs and all that sort of thing, like a lot of the people of that time did, thinking he's having, you know, spiritual encounters. I'm sure they were spiritual encounters, but not necessarily good ones. But Patrick came to the place where he came to faith in Jesus Christ. And there was, he found genuine, life-changing spirituality. Um, and, uh, you know, I've actually, um, Brett and I have been chatting, uh, Brett who oversees uh, men's ministry, and we're thinking of um, having Patrick come to our next men's ministry event and share his testimony. It's a powerful testimony. So enjoy that, fellas. That's in about a month. I know some of you are thinking, But like Patrick, when talking about those desires of the heart, how do you know that those desires are really of God? How do you know they're really of God? Because even as a Christian, it can be confusing. When you're searching for that spiritual direction. Well, one of the scriptures we're we're told here in Hebrews 4, 12, it says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. God's word helps us in the journey because I tell you what, it's not always easy discerning. I'm not talking necessarily about soulish desires that are bad, but it can be a good thing but not a God thing, can't it? How do you, how do you discern? Well, the word of God helps us. How sharp is it? Here's my filleting knife for fishing. And they've got to be sharp when you're filleting fish. Apparently the, um, the verse is based not on the big sword the Romans used, but the little sword they would also carry, which was very, very sharp. It's probably referring to that sort of sword, sharper than a double-edged sword, very, very sharp. See how sharp that is? God's word is like that, very, very sharp. It can penetrate between spiritually, what does it say? Between soul and spirit. What's the point of that? Well, it's, we have soulish desires. God's word helps us see the difference about the spiritual things he's wanting to say to us and the soulish things what might be just of us. They can be sinful things, I know, but they can also be good things but just not of God. You know, one of the other things that I think helps is the, um, 
just being intimate with God in worship. You know, if you're, if you maybe you're singing songs of worship or you're listening to worship, you've got alone, you've got some quiet space by yourself. And in that intimate moment, if you ask God about guidance in that moment, and it seems that that direction becomes stronger, it's very likely it is of God. If it becomes weaker, if it diminishes in that moment of intimacy with God, well, it's probably not of the Lord. My second point is this. Number two, feeling God's vision will release vibrant faith. Can we say that together? Feeling God's vision will release vibrant faith. One more time. Feeling God's vision will release vibrant faith. Not enough about seeing and feeling, but I want to suggest too, it's speaking it out. Speaking it out. God himself models this to us. You think of how the universe was created. Let me read a few verses. Genesis 1.3, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Or one twenty of Genesis. And God said, Let the waters teem with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth and across the vault of the sky. Or one twenty four. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock the creatures that move along the ground, the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God spoke the universe into reality. He spoke, whether it's fish, whether it's birds, whether it's land animals, he spoke it into reality. And can I suggest that? It's actually, there are many things God does that are actually a model for us to follow. And we'll see this. For instance, let me pick someone. The life of Gideon. Remember from the book of Judges, Gideon? Gideon said of himself that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on the, of the smallest tribe and we're the least significant family group within the tribe. He didn't think highly of himself at all. Judges 6.12, when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Was he a mighty warrior? Well, there's certainly no evidence of that. In fact, he was hiding away. Uh, Israel at the time were being dominated by the Midianites. He's hiding. And yet then the angel comes to say to him, you mighty warrior. He's speaking that into Gideon's heart, into his mind, into his life. Uh, 6.14, the Lord now speaks. The Lord turned to him, to Gideon, and said, go in the strength you have. And save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Go in the strength you have. Did he have the strength? Well, God spoke it into his life. Now, one of uh, Yongi Cho's books, um, uh, for those who don't know, he's a, a chap who for many years pastored one of the largest churches in South Korea, the late Yongi Cho, wrote many books. One of them titled The Fourth Dimension. In that particular book, he, he quotes a neuron surgeon. Let me read what the quote is. The neuron surgeon's comments are, the speech centre in the brain rules over the nerves, saying you are tired, old, that you don't have the ability required, you will never find that partner, it will affect the way you feel and act. You got the idea? What we say affects our feelings. And it affects our actions. You know, we, we often think of it the other way around. Well, I don't feel up to it or I don't, you feel a certain way, therefore I can't. But actually the spoken word, when you speak something out, especially into the heavenly realms, it can make a difference. The spoken word is powerful. The Apostle Paul touches on this, again citing Abraham 4.17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our Father in the sight of God, in whom he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they were. Notice that? Calls things that are not as though they were. God speaks things into reality, calls things that are not as though they were. The uh, African-American preacher, he used to be a Baptist pastor many years ago, but been pastoring a mega independent church for many, many years. Let's have a look at T.D. Jakes. Remember this guy? Here he is. You may have listened to him. 
T.D. Jakes has a great message about this. And one of the phrases he uses in the message, he says, open your mouth and speak your deliverance. He says it many times. Of course, he doesn't say it like that. He says, open your mouth and speak your deliverance. What's he saying? He's saying the things that you speak out, you might be burdened. You might be held back. You might be tied down. There might be obstacles all around. He's saying that as you speak things out, it makes a difference. It can change things, especially when that's spoken out into the heavenly realms. It might be in prayer. Open your mouth and speak your deliverance. Number three, speaking God's vision will release vibrant faith. Would you say that with me? Speaking God's vision will release vibrant faith. Again, speaking God's vision will release vibrant faith. One more. Can I also suggest acting on God's vision can release vibrant faith? Because it's not enough to do the other three. We need to take action. We need to act upon it. We see this in Scripture, James 2.20. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together and his faith was made complete by what he did. The Scriptures were fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Now, Martin Luther, the great reformer of the 1500s, I mean, he, um, he didn't like the book of James because <laughs> he thought James was saying we're saved by works. And, of course, Part of Martin Luther's big message, we're saved by God's grace. But I don't think James is saying that at all. James is simply saying that if the faith is genuine, it's going to affect your actions. If your actions are not affected by your faith, it's not real. And Paul, Paul himself, the, the, you know, the master of communicating God's grace, the Apostle Paul, right, right at the point where he says probably his most famous verses about grace he immediately links it with actions. Look, look at these words here. Ephesians 2 verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved, writes Paul, through faith. It is not from yourselves. It is a gift from God, not by works, so no one can boast. But then he adds, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. Paul is simply saying this. You are saved by placing your faith in Jesus and what we remembered today, his work upon the cross. All of our shortcomings are forgiven simply by placing our faith in Jesus, that he truly is the divine son of God. He's not just a good teacher. He's not just a prophet. He is the divine son of God. You place your faith in Jesus and what he achieved on the cross, knowing that he rose from the dead, he's alive today. That's the faith that Paul is talking about. And it's by grace we are saved. God's grace is God's unmerited favour. We don't earn it. But Paul adds, God has prepared in advance good works for us to live out. Those good works don't save us. But when faith is genuine, you cannot help but want to serve the Lord. That's the idea. Can I suggest this? Number four, acting on God's vision will release vibrant faith. Could you say that with me? Acting on God's vision will release vibrant faith. One more time. Acting on God's vision will release vibrant faith. Amen. And just in the last 10 minutes or so of the sermon, I just want to, I want to cast a bit of vision. You know, I've had different people come to me and, and talk about different aspects of vision, some of which have really resonated with me. And I just want to paint a picture of something God might want to do in the journey of our church over the next months. Often when casting vision, you need image or slogans. It helps us remember stuff. 
So here's one I put together this week. Let's have a look at this. Holistic health. Christ is at the centre because genuine health is always going to be based in a real and vital relationship with Jesus. But we have different needs, spiritual needs, mental needs, physical needs and emotional needs. What if we could do an outreach where those needs were being touched by people coming in from the community? Let me share a couple of ideas. Well, several ideas. One of the things that uh, Lisa was just chatting about um, this week is uh, she became aware that the local council is wanting a food bank centre. It's my last church, a um, couple of churches back, Narry Warren, we used to run a food bank. But it was not just about the food bank. It was a lot more intricate and complicated and broader in its ministry than that. But what's the idea? How would a food bank work? Well, um, it's on Tuesdays, about 11 to about 2. And the idea is people come and, of course, collect food. The government, you know, the local council with, with others, others provide the food and they provide a bit of training for the team. But they need a centre in Epping on Tuesdays for three hours. Um, now I wouldn't jump at the idea of running a food bank, but what if it could be coupled with a holistic type of outreach? How would it work? Well, um, often at food banks people queue up. There might be 50 or so people queuing up, and um, some of them have got to queue up for quite a while. Well, instead of queuing up, this is a Lisa idea, you give them a ticket, like when you go to Vic Roads, and you grab your ticket and you sit there and wait for an hour until you eventually get to register your car or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> um, so get a ticket. But the idea is they don't queue, they get the ticket, come into our cafe, for instance, sit down, we might even make them a coffee. They're sitting there in the cafe environment, air-conditioned, Nice, pleasant environment. There's dignity in that, isn't there? My thoughts are that as people come, we can actually hand them a little brochure about some things that are being offered. Now, you've just seen John up today uh, leading communion. Now, John is a professional counsellor, amongst other things. And John's willing to offer free counselling. John's reasonably flexible with these hours, you see how that could work, couldn't you? We mentioned that could be announced, but it's in the brochure as well. Imagine someone's there. They know they're going to be waiting for about an hour for their food, whatever. They have a half an hour counselling session with John. Talking there about mental health, you know, helping the mental health journey. For another, it might be physical health. You've got Andrew, who's, um, uh, you would have read a bit about him there on your seats. He's um, been nominated as a board member. Andrew, of course, he does a bit of personal training. Actually, we're offering some after the service today. I'm, I'm going to join in. I certainly need it. <laughs> and we often run it just around, around this area, move the seats back a little bit, but a little bit of personal training. But you can see that again. You know, imagine if that's being offered as well. Look, we've got a personal training session for 20 minutes while you're here. And, uh, and personal trainer here, he's also able to give some advice about diet and health and practice, that sort of thing. It could work, couldn't it? Little class of people doing a bit of training. What about emotional health? One of the things that I think helps a lot with emotions is getting out in the sunshine, using your hands. Well, Benjamin and Adam, they've got, they've got a heart to have a little community garden here. Imagine that. Someone is waiting, but they can come out and spend half an hour in the community garden. A bit of weeding, a bit of planting, a bit of watering. The next week, the plant will have grown, won't it? There'll be a change. Um... Benjamin's happy to supervise that. Um, by the way, John from the Arabic church, he's already given us permission to do that, by the way. Uh, the head deacon of the Arabic church. Um, or, or, you know, actually, with the whole area of emotional health, but you just think of the sense of community can, can be created with all this as well. People are sitting around, having a bit of a chat, whether it's cafe or it might be in here doing a workout, whatever but the sense of community can be established in a journey with that sort of thing too, which affects mental health. What about spiritual health? Well, you know, one of the things that um, I'd like to see around the venue is a whole bunch of Christian tracks. But not necessarily just your standard ones. The brilliant ones like, you know, the little orange bridge to life track that's been used. Millions and millions of 
of these being shared with people. But also, you know, a little bit of targeting. Uh, Roz, who's with us today, it's really nice that she can be here. We had a bit of a chat this morning. Some time back, how long ago would that have been, Roz? 18 months ago, two years ago? Can't remember. About two years back. About two years ago, um, Roz had a, a concert, a violin concert, because she's a teacher, teaches violin, and a whole bunch of her students, you know, performed here at, at the church, not on a Sunday. Um, but Roz said to me, Lee, I've heard you talk about linking Buddhism and Christianity and how you can present the gospel. Would you create for me a tract, a brochure? So I did, Jesus and Buddhist philosophy. And in the tract I talk a little bit about the Eightfold Path, which is actually really good moral teaching from Sahara Gautama, the founder of Buddhism. Um, but I talk about the fact that Sahara Gautama said, I'm a fellow traveller on the journey towards enlightenment. There's a lot of quotes from John's Gospel, and part one of the quotes is Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the enlightenment, discovering that relationship with him. So it's a gentle kind of track, but it ultimately points people to Jesus. And I use the phrase living water, quoting from uh, John chapter 4, and coupled with it were these little John's Gospels titled Living Water. You got the idea. Having stuff like that uh, scattered around the building. Um, I mentioned Bridge to Life. I mean, I've done a couple of versions of Bridge to Life too where I add some stuff in. This one starts with a whole bunch of information about the Word of God. Can you even trust it? I mean, why should people trust the Bible? It starts with that because the Scripture's quoted. What's the point in quoting Scripture if people don't believe it? But it starts by giving some persuasion, actually. It is trustworthy and there's good reason for it. And it's incredibly popular, the most downloaded book in the world, the most sold book in the world. And so another one I've got is where I talk about um, God, there being an intelligence behind creation, behind the universe. And Adam, who I can see nodding there, he came along to an Easter service um, about a year ago now, and that was the beginning of the message. I talked about the evidence, largely from atheists, that there must be an intelligence behind the creation of the universe. It just it doesn't make sense. There's too many things. that There's no way this could happen by chance. Well, if it didn't happen by chance, it has a designer. It has an intelligence behind it. And for Adam, that was really helpful because he, he would sit in that place where he's pretty much an atheist. That helped him realise you don't have to throw your brain out to believe in the reality of God. And that particular message then went on to the evidence for the resurrection because it was an Easter outreach. We've also got apparently these events too. Um, so I was told that often at the food bank there's quite often Arabic folk queuing up. Now, I don't speak Arabic, but uh, we have Solomon, who's connected with our church, and uh, Bill, who brings the bread here. Bill does evangelistic stuff all the time. Uh, those two Arabic background guys, they have a, a stack of tracks in Arabic like these that they give out to people all the time. You could see how they... They're flexible hours to those two guys. They could be a part of this too. And what do you do from there? Well, you can imagine. In the journey of these tracks being everywhere, you've got people that have a heart for evangelism, like Andrew, who I'm just talking about. Lisa's actually very good at evangelism. Lisa Doherty. Myself. We've got us mingling around these people in the journey of chatting through stuff, starting conversations and seeing what God does. And then what do you do is you've got a little group of these people that are starting to open up and start to get a little bit interested in Jesus. How do, how do you take it further? Well, you know, we can put on an outreach service here at this church, run some sort of outreach where we're inviting people along to an event where they can make a decision for Christ and follow that up with an alpha course. You can see how it can all fit together. Just to add a, a further scenario, um, one of the other, um, actually we'll put this picture up here. This is a, the bloke's gathering. Uh, yesterday, uh, the fellas popped in a trampoline. That's cemented in place and it's levelled. I've seen the level on top there. It's completely level. Um, some of the little kids have already tried it out and I was told that was okay because it was so hot yesterday the cement will have completely set. Um, adults and youth are not supposed to be on it. It's a kid's one. Just remember that. 
Uh, but imagine developing that little area. You can see the little cement path there, extending that a little bit, having some little coffee tables out there perhaps, three or four coffee tables, two seats each, turning it into a proper play area. You can imagine, say, some young mums queuing up for food bank who've got, had to drag a couple of little kids with them. Sitting out there having a coffee while their kids play, there's dignity in that, isn't there? Now, I realise all that costs money and uh, it's a bit tricky, but I imagine the Arabic church would, would put some money towards it too. It's pretty hard to get council grants. It's a lot of work. Um, I, um, in my church at Narry Warren, we used to get a $2,000 grant for our Christmas production every year. Um, but uh, it, one of the girls in the church, um, and she was a, in, the, in the area of, uh, she read law documents, proofread law documents, etc. So she's very good at that sort of stuff. But, yeah, we used to get that two grand from the government every year, but you'd need someone who's you know, going to put the time in. It's a tricky thing to do. So we might not get a grant. That would be lovely if we did. But, um, but it's possible. It's doable, I think. We might not have to spend that much to set that area up, get it looking nice. Now, this stuff is just vision. It's just vision. But so many things start with just vision. I remember Stuart Robinson telling the story about Blackburn Baptist. They hadn't been growing. Part of the restraints in their case was the building. Stuart had a vision to completely relocate and start Crossway Baptist from Blackburn Baptist. Met with enormous opposition. But I've gone to this church for years. Well, they got it through just in the vote, purchased the land and built the phenomenal building. They had about 800-ish um, people, people who were members, formal members, 300 left immediately. And so you can imagine a lot of the income, you'd think it would drop with the offerings. Didn't seem to. And they launched the new church venue. And a church that had been, a big church, about 800 turning up thereabouts over their two services on a Sunday. But within just a couple of years, it grew from 800 to being a couple of thousand. And from a couple of thousand to being about 4,000 in attendance. Just kept growing. But it started with vision. It started with vision. It started with vision. It just started with vision. That's all it was. It was just an idea. It was just a sense of thing that God is saying this but ultimately became something pretty phenomenal. Can I list these things? What have we learned today? Seeing, that's the next slide, seeing, feeling, speaking, acting on God's vision will release vibrant faith. Will we say that one time together? Seeing, feeling, speaking, acting on God's vision will release vibrant faith. Amen. Let me just ask you again. Perhaps God's got some fresh vision for you. It could be this year. There's more in 2024. So whether it's the university course that you've recently started, whether it's a change in your career, whether it's um, some promotion in your workplace, whether it's seeking that new marriage partner, whether it's some, God something saying something to you about your retirement years or what is the Lord saying about helping you, what, what, what is the Lord saying about you helping perhaps with some of these future possible ministries? I'll say that one again. What is the Lord saying about you helping with some of these potential new ministries? Let's be a prayerful people. Let's put up that holistic cross one more time. Let's allow that, that image there to be a part of our mind. Could God be calling our church to something like this? Holistic help. Christ at the centre, but reaching people spiritually, mentally, physically and emotionally, seeing people's needs met in a holistic way. Well, at a time like this, I reckon I should ask Sue to pray. Come and pray for us, Sue. Oh, Dad, we've heard a lot. <laughs> and we thank you 
We thank you for everything. We thank you for what you're doing by your Holy Spirit in this place. Father, we thank you for your word that the pastors brought to us today. Rich, but not just for to, for us to hear and not just for us to chomp on during the week, but for us to also act on. Father, we thank you for your vision for this church. And we thank you for the vision that you have given or will give up to us individually. And we thank you that they dovetail, that they work together. Lord, we thank you that you took Abraham out from the claustrophobic enclosed tent and took him out. And, Lord, we want to be brave and courageous and step out from the little place and into the place where we can see what you have to show us, the grains of the sand and the stars of the sky, the holistic health that we've seen up on the, on the picture there. And our hearts open to receive the vision that you have we lay aside anything that's soul and ask for clarity of vision. Lord, our hearts hunger for your will, not ours, your kingdom, not ours. So we just align ourselves afresh, prepared now for the coming week to see, to hear to speak and to act on what you have given to us individually and us as a church. In Jesus' name, for your glory. Amen.